Last week on Doorstep History, we featured the Zeppelin raids over the Black Country, which caused death and destruction across Tipton, Wensbury and Walsall. This week, exactly 100 years after the shocking events, we look at the aftermath of the incidents and at the way the Black Country has commemorated the events of a century ago. Until this week, the most visible reminder of the raids was this plaque on a wall located next to the remains of a shrapnel-damaged wall in Walsall. Perhaps the most startling remnant of the raids lies in this box in the collection centre of Walsall Museum. It's the remains of one of the devices that was dropped on the town during the night that changed the face of the Black Country. It's currently on display at a World War I exhibition in Walsall Leather Museum. The shock of the raids was felt across the West Midlands. This entry in a school logbook from St Peter's School at Broad Street in Birmingham reads as follows. Miss Miller has been absent from school for the last couple of days as she is suffering from shock following the air raid on Wensbury. The name of the towns involved were never officially announced in government statements, but that didn't stop the Germans from making their own announcements for propaganda purposes. They claimed that Birmingham munition factories had been destroyed. This claim was described in the British press as a farage of lies. Derek has researched the coroner's reports on the Tipton victims. I, up until a few weeks ago, thought that all 14 had got willful murder by the Kaiser and his son, the Crown Prince, before and after the fact. There is one out of the 14 which hasn't got that on. And this happened to be Annie Wilkinson. Annie Wilkinson was taken to the Dudley Guest Hospital. She lasted 29 hours before she died. Any inquest was held at Dudley. That was why, when you read reports, there were only 13 victims mentioned. There were actually 14. They get the 13 off the 13 inquest, see, yeah. which has got the Kaiser on. Yeah, but uh, Annie, but Annie, uh, and, uh, Annie had, was out of Tipton. Out of, she, was she, was in, she died in Dudley, in so the inquest was held in Dudley. Consequently, the Kaiser is not on their death certificate. The funerals of seven Zeppelin victims took place yesterday. Beautiful floral tributes covered the coffins. A huge crowd lined the route of the procession. A pathetic figure behind one of the coffins was a woman who had been deprived of her husband, three children and mother. Pathetic scenes were witnessed as seven coffins were lowered into a common grave. That is the only known headstone of 11 victims that I can confirm are buried here. The rest are in pauper's graves to our left, down this row. So the 11 are, are buried here with no, with no grave? There's, there's no grave. They, 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 they're what is known as pauper's graves. So why, why would it be that these 11 people are in a pauper's grave? Money. They were just ordinary working people, elderly. There was a subscription held at the time, but most of that money was spent on floor arrangements, according to the newspapers. So more money was spent on a flower collection than actually a grave for them. Exactly. We're addressing that on the 5th of February, when we're unveiling a plaque to the 14 victims at 10 o'clock here at the cemetery. So. Although there's no headstones, at least they will have a memorial. There were more impressive scenes at the funeral services held at St James's Church in Wensbury. It's obvious that this is the right location, isn't it? Yes, I've uh, reproduced in my book. On the right, at the bottom, we can clearly see the ironwork of the original gates to St James's Church in Wensbury the newspapers of the time shows the funerals uh, being carried out by Sidney Webb and Son, a, a long established uh, undertaker in the town. And to the left, two pages from 
Sydney's 1916 order book where I was able to find all 15 Wensbury victims listed clearly even down to the height 5 foot 11 and the breadth across the shoulders 19 inches of Albert Gordon Maidley aged 21 uh, we're in Wood Green Cemetery beneath our feet and we don't know exactly where but in this area of Wood Green Cemetery at Wensbury lie about nine victims of the Zeppelin raid uh, they're buried in three unmarked graves um, for want of a better description pauper graves because the fact that there's no memorials the coroner uh, is known to have stated uh, to the jury that uh, his words as you can see the bodies are in such bad condition and state of decay that they need to be buried sooner rather than later so uh, I suppose rather hasty arrangements were made uh, for them to be buried here um, the press described the pitiful scenes uh, the public were actually excluded from the cemetery as well. Uh, part of the reason was because at the time most news was suppressed and censored and also um, the locals were very generous, although they were hard pressed for money at the time, in providing uh, floral tributes um, which were scattered around the graves. And of course on the other side of the cemetery we can actually see a memorial stone. So let's go and have a look at that. Where I am now, in front of the uh, memorial, which mysteriously was placed here in 2012 by a local resident who uh, very graciously doesn't want publicity, uh, but he's a very good friend of mine and known to many Wensbury folk. And here we've got listed most of the victims of the King Street Raid. Uh, very poignantly, uh, we've got little seven-year-old Ina, who was uh, the youngest victim. In early March 1916, well-known footballers Harry Hamilton and Jess Pennington played a prominent part in organising and playing in fundraising matches, with proceeds going to the families of the victims. Harry Hampton of Aston Villa and Jess Pennington of West Bromwich Albion have been doing good in arranging and participating in charity football matches. And again on Saturday, one of their efforts met with great success at Wensbury, where, on the old athletic ground, two teams comprised of well-known players met in aid of the fund for the relief of the victims of the recent Zeppelin raid. Jess Pennington was unable, through injury, to captain his side, but he acted as referee. He'd found employment on essential war work at Metro Camel Carriage Works in Handsworth and devoted as much time as possible to fundraising efforts. Pennington was able to arrange other games and to use his name to attract star players. Whenever they turned out for works teams such as that of Bellis and Morecambe of Ladywood, large crowds of spectators were assured and the coffers of the relief fund were filled by spectators, all starved of seeing their favourite footballer in league action. In the weeks following the raids, stories about Zeppelins dominated the press. A 71-year-old woman in the workhouse apparently died of excitement when she heard an alarm. Companies were quick to advertise insurance protection from future Zeppelin raids. Life continued as normal against the backdrop of uncertainty. This social gathering was said to be a perfect tonic for Zeppelin nerves. In what was seen as the first of its kind in the Midlands, a Semitic man was fined £5 for attempting to delay, restrict or impede the production of work necessary for the successful prosecution of the war by falsely claiming that Zeppelins were coming from Netherton and he caused a panic at his works. An Semitic man was called a fool after making a violent outcry that Zeppelins were coming over Edgebaston. He was told it was an idiotic thing to shout in the street, particularly as it was 1.06 in the morning.
Meanwhile, a Walsall man made a public humble apology for claiming a local butcher was a German. A chimney sweep applied for the exemption from joining the army because he swept the chimneys of wounded soldiers free of charge, and if chimneys were not swept, they could catch a light and attract zeppelins. His appeal was brushed aside. Exactly 100 years ago, 35 people were killed across the black country when German zeppelins carried out one of the most audacious raids of the war. In this part of the programme, we'll look at some of the events that have been held to commemorate the centenary of the atrocity. The Tipton Civic Society, working with Derek Nichols, organised for a plaque to be unveiled in Union Street. Well, the Tipton Civic Society likes to uh, keep alive the history and heritage of Tipton as well as looking forward to the future and trying to uh, um, make sure the right developments occur and so on. This was a particularly interesting one to, or important one to commemorate because the, um, the Zeppelin raid has always been in the consciousness of, of Tipton people. Uh, in fact, I remember my own grandmother telling me about it. Uh, in the 1960s, but of course as a teenager you don't take that much notice. But it, nevertheless, everybody knows that it happened. But what, what has been forgotten now, uh, with the passage of time, is the identity of the victims. And we discovered that the victims had never been commemorated in any way. Um, so we decided to rectify that by uh, not, not just putting a blue plaque on the site, but also in the, in the library we've created a roll of, roll of memory with the names on, which was actually unveiled yesterday by, by Adrian Bailey. So it's important to keep those names, uh, those names in the public consciousness as well, as well as the event itself. Adrian Bailey, the MP for West Bromwich West, performed the unveiling. It's incredibly important because I'm sure there are thousands of Tiptonians who, like myself, have been past this spot so many times without realising that history was created here. Uh, this Zeppelin raid was pro possibly the first ever mass bombing raid carried out on civilians in this country and the first three bombs landed on this spot killing 14 uh, people and I think it's only right that uh, this should be uh, visible, remembered and commemorated so that Tiptonians and the uh, ancestors of those people who were killed during that raid can feel a pride in the resilience of their community in the face of this appalling atrocity. And a quick word about the turnout today, mm. magnificent number of people here. Yeah, for a cold January afternoon it really is a demonstration of the strength, resilience and community spirit that you'll find in this area. It's just wonderful to know and to realise what our ancestors went through. I mean, my father came here at 17, knowing nothing about what had happened, was met by a policeman on the towpath, just taken to this and then to see this devastation. And then he just had to go back, back in the army and carry on as normal. Thomas Morris that was in the cinema was, was my grandfather and he heard the explosion in the cinema, came back to here knowing where it would have happened to find that his wife had perished, two children and his mother-in-law and father-in-law and he actually helped to get the bodies out of the debris. So there's an interesting artefact I suppose we could call it. It really, is, yes, they, yeah? it is. Um, the family legend on this is that um, Sarah Jane was wearing this ring on the night that she was killed and that um, they found her hand down on, on Lockside on the towpath and the way that they identified it was through the ring. It's a very distinctive, it's a very distinctive ring. Um, probably don't see very many like this. It came down to my father, my late father, and he passed it on to my brother. So it's it stayed in the Morris family with the name Morris being attached to it all the way down. 
Local historian Derek Nichols worked with the Friends of Tipton Cemetery to erect a permanent reminder of the 14 Tipton victims. We nobody knew the name of the 14 victims. So I spent about two and a half years researching the victims, found the 14, but then found out the only mentions of the Zeppelin raid is Louisa York, who was on a war memorial in Tipton at Salem Street, and the one in Tipton Cemetery, Benjamin Goldie. So I thought that they need to be named. So I put all the names together on a plaque, and we were unveiling. They were buried between the fifth, between the fourth and seventh of February 1916 so on the 5th of February 100 years to the day we're going to unveil a plaque with all the names on in the cemetery. The ceremony was performed by Adrian Bailey MP. To a great pleasure and great pride that I now hopefully can unveil this. They played as much important part as anybody else did. They deserve to be recognised. Youngsters from the nearby ACE Academy attended the event. Well, we're coming here today to uh, represent the ACE Academy because we're interested in uh, finding out about the local history and making sure that this, uh, the Zeppelin bombing, which is a, a massive part of the local history, is remembered for, by all. Oh, well, why, is it, why is it important, do you think, that we should youngsters like yourself should remember this well it, it is it's so important because it's a, you know like I said it's a massive part of the local history and it just reminds us that not only what our ancestors have been through but that war isn't just on the front line and that it affects everyone and then we must remember that so did you know much yes. about what had happened here until these recent events I, I knew a little uh, you know about, about the the raid that had actually happened and that people had died but I didn't know how devastating it actually was, 14 people died, four of which were children, you know, and you, you just realise how lucky we are. So what does it mean for you to be here today then, Junior? It means to, to me to be proud, just, just because we're young doesn't mean we can't remember all those people who lost their lives in the Zeppelin bombing. It's difficult to imagine, isn't it, about what it would be like trying to navigate. It's difficult for us to understand, perhaps, that they managed to get lost 200 years ago, isn't it? Yeah, because the yeah, because now the modern technology we have, it's really hard to actually get lost. Like you've got like GPSs, compasses, yeah, but you didn't have them in them time. And yeah, it makes you feel they didn't have to get killed, they could have lived a lot longer. The crew of one of the Zeppelins involved in the raid were also killed. Whilst returning to Germany, their Zeppelin crashed into the North Sea. A fishing vessel arrived at the scene, but the captain refused to take the Germans on board, fearing that his own crew could have been overcome by the force of numbers. He returned to port to report the incident, but the Zeppelin crew were never seen again. The North Sea provides one last local link with Zeppelins, in the form of a member of the Cadbury family, known as Egbert. For two years, Egbert lodged here, what is now the Colton Hotel, on the seafront at Great Yarmouth, overlooking the North Sea, from where the Zeppelins would come. Cadbury married the daughter of a local vicar, and she was singing in a choir in a local theatre one day, with Cadbury, when the alarm went off. Time to scramble. He took off in a DH4 like this and he came back a hero. This excellent model on display in Sheringham Museum shows the scale of the small aircraft compared to the bulk of the Zeppelin. Egbert won the Distinguished Service Cross for shooting down that Zeppelin in 1916 and he later went into the record books as being the person who in August 1918 shot down the last Zeppelin of the war. Our last story we return to Wensbury where all 35 victims were remembered in a moving memorial service at St Bartholomew's Church. 
A candle was lit for each of the innocent victims, and their names were read out to a silent congregation. Elizabeth Cartwright, Thomas M. Church. Innocent eyes look to moonless skies in deference, awe, and fear. It started with a hum, drone and a rattle, and a beat on a funeral drum. No light was put out because without doubt everyone felt safe in their homes. By explosive devices aimed so low brought devastation to this crisis. Dudley, Tipton, Brayley, Wensbury and Warsaw could hardly believe what AEM had brought. What lay in store, none of them knew as the earth felt the shudder of war. Thirty-five lay dead, they say, in the cold light of day. Their stories to be found of that fateful day when German airships came around.